Hi, everybody. George the Tech. I cannot believe I'm finally... What we, what have I been waiting for? And finally getting to chat with my longtime client, collaborator, friend, and partner with so many things. We have so much to talk about today. But today I've got with me at long last Rick Wasserman. How are you Thank doing? Thank you. Thank you, George. I'm doing okay. Yeah. It has it's been a long while. The two two guys from Philly. We've been at it for for quite some time. You can tell, can't you? I mean, look at our I know. Beards. Look at us. No, very, very <laughs> youthful. Very youthful. Yeah. We keep it together. We, we have known each other a really long time. We're also, what are we, a day apart in age or something? Crazy? That crazy? Like that? Yeah. yeah. It's so fascinating. Both from Philly. And um, gosh, we've been working together for eons. Um, so Rick, give us a quick rundown of a little bit about your background. You know, the time leading up to kind of when we met and started working together. How did you cut your teeth in, in acting? Because I know you have a what, we, what they would consider a legit acting background, right? I know. Isn't that terrible that they call that legit? That word? The fact that you've been on TV or film it's or on the jargon, stage. It's jargon, right? That's legit. The word legit is a, is a yeah. legit. Is Everything jargon, else right? is uh, illegit. Right. But this is legit. Right, right. It's silly. Right. But um, yeah, so I grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan until I was six, and then I moved to Philadelphia, and uh, I went to high school there. I went to college there. I went to St. Joe's and then I transferred to Temple. And all the while I've been acting and acting. And then I went to graduate school at UMKC, Missouri, Kansas City. And then when we got out, we all went to New York and we all got agents and didn't work. <laughs> you know, it just, <laughs> right, yeah, just an abrupt stop. You got uh, real good at serving, serving tables. Did I, yes. My French service was perfect in my cater waitering days. But um, but I thought that at some point, even though I was auditioning for TV and um, and commercials, that at some point I thought I would likely do voiceover. I hadn't done any before, but because my voice was deep and because enough people had asked me like, hey, do you do voiceover? And I'd always say, yeah, no. Yeah, when you, you have should. a certain voice, it's inevitable, right? Yeah, so I think that. I kind of had that. My voice was deep. And I thought at some yeah. point in time, I might do some voiceover. But I hadn't done any. And... I was the, this is the same story I tell all the time. It's so silly, but okay. I got cast as the zest soap guy. So, yeah. so I was the zest soap guy. That's an on camera. That's, that's an, an on camera thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I had my, they had to wax me cause I was fairly hair suit at the time. And, uh, and I'm in a shower with a thousand cameras watching me, you know, as you do and doing that and the commercials were doing well. And so my agents at the time said they wanted to, spend some more time working with me because I was making everybody money. And in that meeting at the agency, I was sitting with the on-camera commercial agent. He and I were talking and the voiceover agent walked by the office and he heard my voice and he peeked his head in and he said, do you do voiceover? And I went, no. And he said, do we represent you? And I said, yeah. And he went, come here, come here. And he pulled me out and that guy became my agent for the next 15 years. No way. That's that's the classic luck favors the prepared situation, which <laughs> there's another story that hopefully you'll mention later about a guy walking by an office looking inside. And That's right. Yes, we'll talk I, about that yes, later. I, that, that's I a just, for, foreshadow. I cross my fingers for those moments. They're the best moments. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and so I had a voiceover agent all of a sudden, uh, but not a whole lot of training. When I say not a whole lot, I mean like a weekend in grad school is all we had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we walked out with a demo on a cassette tape. Like, we thought we were prepared, hey. but not, not so prepared. Six months of auditioning, even callbacks and nothing. And then mm -hmm. my day came when I got a call from my agent. They said, listen, we have an audition for a promo. And I went, ah, what sort of thing is that? And they said, mm. it's like a commercial for a TV show. Uh, mm. And this is when you had to audition at your agency, which we don't do so much anymore. Yeah. We're at home. At this point, you're in New York City? I'm in New York City, yep. Uh, okay. Don Buckwald mm -hmm. and Associates. Mm -hmm. So I go in. And the booth engineer is not there that day. And instead, um, Stuart Nacht, who was like an agent's assistant at the time, I owe my whole career to this guy, um, he was filling in. And I went in for this promo and I read it the way I thought I should read it. And he said, Rick, can I stop you? I said, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. And he said, you're in The Lion King. And at the time I was in The Lion King on Broadway. Oh, yeah. And he said, yeah. you play Scar? And I went, yeah. And he said, do it like Scar. I went, you mean put on the vo like do do Scott? No, 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 no. I just mean you should approach this voiceover the same way you approach playing Scar. That is, it's just another acting gig. 
who are role. you and who are you talking character. to and what do you yeah. want and how do you get it? And I thought, I mean, that's too easy. It can't be like that, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. I thought there's acting and then there's voiceover. But it turns yeah, out you were that, thinking that this was an this is an announcing gig that's right or like a but but he was saying no this is an acting gig and you are an actor so treated act. the same and like <laughs> idiot you've been training to do this four years yeah. in college and three years in grad school and on Broadway right. like you know what to do just do that yeah. so I did it and yeah. booked it like right wow. away and it was wow. for uh, the voice of a show a new show at the time called The Wire on HBO mm-hmm. yeah and then I and so I was suddenly the voice of The Wire. The Wire, tap in on HBO. And then oh, yeah. I started doing other shows on HBO. Um, Oz yeah. and all these different shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I was doing the rundowns like tonight on HBO, Superman 3 at 8, that kind of thing. So the and, promo thing was sticking. And the promo thing just hit. And that's why I've always told my students, I said, listen, Sometimes there's just a natural evolution that happens. Someone will hear your voice for something. Someone else yeah. that is casting will hear that and think, we like that too. We'd like some of that. Does that mean I can't do commercials? No, I can. But for whatever reason, I didn't study promos, but that's sort of where I landed, where my mm-hmm. voice was appreciated the most. So mm-hmm. that led to other gigs, other networks, the voice of um, ABC daytime for eight years. I did all the soaps. I never watched the soap yeah. opera, but did all the soaps. The voice of uh, UFC for eight years. Uh, these long kind of tenures with companies because I had a process, right? I went to acting yeah. school. I knew what steps to take to tell the story. Yeah. And I kept my head down. I kept my head down and did the work. And I made it too easy. You know, I made it so easy that they couldn't get rid of me. It was just too easy. I would I would edit and, and fix my own you know, takes before I sent them in, labeled yeah. them. I learned yeah. their birthdays and, you know, I just made it real easy. Remember oh, yeah. at, at voiceover at the time, I didn't really have coworkers. So the producers I work with sort of become my coworkers right. and, and you have friendships and you grow up together. Yeah. And so that's how it was. So I became the voice of A&E for but four you moved, years. There's a I move in there somewhere. Cause oh, yeah. I didn't meet you in New York. Yeah, that's right. It's coming. So I became the voice of A and E uh, for four years, and the day that went away, right? They just rebranded, mm-hmm. found someone else. The day that went away, I picked up a new network, which was AMC, yeah. which at the time was American Movie Classics, but they weren't showing any movie classics. They wanted to start showing original content, and yep. one of their first shows was this show called Mad Men. And so they said, "Rick, we've yes. got a show called Mad Men. We're going to start working on." how do you think it should sound? And I went, oh, boy, no one's <laughs> ever asked me what I thought it should sound like. And I said, I have an idea. And so I presented it to them and they liked it and we went with it. So I was the voice of that and everything else on that channel. So I'm doing Breaking Bad and The Walking Dead. So I'm doing all the shows on that for almost 15 years. And somewhere in there, I, I moved to L.A., I moved to LA. So, so up until the point you moved, were you doing uh, 100% of this work in, in studios in New York? Yeah, I was doing it all in studios. I didn't that's have... how New York City is, really. I mean, it's like, it's it's a studio town, right? There's a, it was, there's it was studios a all thing. over. Yeah. yeah. And even when I moved to LA for a while, I was at Wood Holly and all these other places. Oh, man, yeah. Um, just spending my time every that's day. That's how I know in. you, by the way. If you hadn't worked at Wood Holly, I don't know if I would have ever met you because you were getting recorded and engineered by Steve Nafshin. That's right. Right? That's exactly right. Yeah. And that was pretty much how it happened. Because between Steve and then your manager at the time, Jason Marks, yeah. that's how we kind of that's that's exactly how right. that came together. Well, it became a point where I, I was spending more time traveling back and forth to studios. Or I would leave the studio and come home and they'd say, oh, we've got a pickup. And get back and they want to hurry up and we're going to go to air. So it... It was like, it behooves you, Rick, to have some means of recording at home. And because now technology is you know, such that it is, you can record at home with really good results. Yeah. And so, Without a ridiculous, uh, complicated, exactly. over-the-top pro And so they blah, said, blah, blah, blah. you need to talk to George Whittem. And that's when you and I finally met and you built my first studio. And then and I you believe just, that was 2005, by yeah, the way, because I found gosh. an old invoice. Yeah. And uh, that, I believe That's it was. 20 yeah. years, my friend. 20, 20 years. years. Uh, yeah. And every place we've lived, you've, you've re-engineered my studio. And 
And I've always been, listen, I've been a big fan of yours for such a long time <laughs> because of this. Oh. You know, at the time we met, I was making some fairly good money with the Broadway mm -hmm. show and commercials and, and mm -hmm. multiple networks of voiceover. I never thought I'd make a dime. But here, suddenly, mm -hmm. I had money. And I said, I need to put together a studio, put it together for me. And shockingly, it was not like you pushed the fanciest equipment on me with all the dials and all the lights. You said, this yeah. is all you need. Or let's try this one and this one and see what sounds better. And if yeah. the one that was cheaper sounded better is what we went with, which, which I thought was very honorable. Like you could have, you could have taken me, you could have just had me buy all the fancy stuff, but I didn't need it. Well, yeah. I mean, I came from a person who was the guy that I mentored under setting up home studios first for Howard Parker Yeah, um, was Lane Massey. And he was the engineer at the radio station where I ended up interning and then actually subsequently working. Yeah. And his philosophy was similar. I mean, I learned my philosophy from him, right? Like I, I owe everything to him, which is practical solutions. Yeah. You know, uh, if a Mackie mixer is what you need, you, you don't need an SSL. You don't need a $10,000 console. A $300 Mackie mixer is what you need, right? Yeah. So it was very practical. What works? What's reliable? And sometimes a Neumann U87 is the mic. Sometimes it's going to be a Sennheiser 416. But whatever it is, just keeping it relatively simple yes, and getting to the point. And that's kind of the philosophy that I had, and that's what I brought to you. So that's always been the name of the game. Boy, know? that's really helpful, especially for a guy like, I'm not afraid of the tech, but it's just not my favorite part of it. There's some people that just love the gear, and I have no problem with that. Yeah. It's just not me. I sort of want it to be there to support the work that I do, which is I do, storytelling right. in front of a mic. The rest of yeah. it, I don't really want to know about. I really want to just hit the button and have it work. And so you yeah. made it sort of stupid proof that, you know, it was just going to work. Uh, and that's always the goal. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's always the goal. I want the equipment to disappear. I want the acting to take precedence. I don't want there to be unnecessary steps and minutia. You know, that's, I don't want that to get in the way. Yeah. That's always been the philosophy. See, now I feel mm -hmm. like the old guy. Like when I was a kid, we didn't have to worry about that. But now, of course, m more and more voiceover actors have to consider not just the tech, but they're producing themselves. They're their own agents. They're their own yeah. directors. Sometimes they're even doing their own copy, right? Just say whatever you want. Just mention these five things. Well, <laughs> now you're writing the spot. You know, it's a full-blown entrepreneurial engineer, pursuit. Engineering, yeah. So there's so much there. And, and at some point, I'm thinking to myself, boy, I, I wish you could just get in there and tell a story. Like, that's yeah, really what yeah. you're supposed to do. And now you got to do so many other things. But When did you decide to, to step into the coaching role then as with Bookable? So it's because I have friends that are actors, you know, the, the the friends that I went to school with and the friends that I did shows with, they found out, like, you know, you check in with each other. How are things? Are you you still cater waitering? What's going on? And yeah. uh, no, I'm not doing any of that anymore. I'm doing voiceover. Oh, you cracked that code? Well, it wasn't so much to crack. You know, I pretty much did this and this. Well, what happens when you're in this situation? What do you do? Well, what I've been doing is this. So all of a sudden, I started having these conversations, this communication, yeah. correspondence of how I do what I was doing. And these emails and phone calls and these conversations ultimately became sort of a curriculum. You know, uh, my father was a teacher. My mother was a teacher. My wife's a teacher. Uh, and I went to grad school and I had to teach. So I sort of have a, a mind for teaching and structuring lesson plans. And yeah. instead of just having, you know, uh, 10, 15 minute long conversations with people, I thought it'd be easier if I can just sort of show them comprehensively how I do it. And so I started teaching kind of workshops, not yet webinars. Tech wasn't there yeah. for that, but yeah. just workshops, yeah. which became yeah. popular. And then I started doing some one-on-one -on -one with people. By the way, one of my first students is far more successful than I'll ever be. <laughs> and I, and I, take, uh, I take all responsibility. But uh, yeah, some, some people just really, really hit it. So I started teaching and then uh, more and more, I started teaching uh, one-on-ones. I used to teach at the Don LaFontaine voiceover lab uh, at the SAG yeah. After building. Did a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, I guest lectured at a number of groups, uh, you know, like uh, 
voiceover peer on peer sort of groups in, in and sure. around LA. And then yeah. I started when the internet was you know, became what it was. I started doing online groups and um, yep. facilitating those. Uh, yep. I would go to, then I would, we'll, we'll talk about the tri booth in a second, but when I was able to move around a bit now, uh, go do a show in uh, Cleveland and go do a show in Colorado, then I would go to local universities and teach master classes at graduate programs. So I got to grow it and grow it and grow it. The turning point for Bookable was, I would train someone as far as they could with me. And then now you just have to kind of go off and you need to make a demo and you need to just start getting gigs. You need to just have some real world experience. And they'd say, well, who should make my demo? And I go, well, you know, you find someone that will learn your voice and get along with you. But Rick, you know my voice so well now. I know. Well, I, okay. I'll figure out how to make a demo because I've never made one for someone. So I got together with an engineer. Uh, Greg Chun is our engineer, and he and I have been producing demos now uh, for years and years and years because it was just the next logical part of the evolution. How could I, in good conscience, you know, train someone all the way up until a demo and then say, okay, see you, good luck. You know, now it feels like, well, yeah. all that work we've done, let's capture that in a demo that showcases yeah. not just how you sound, because of course it will do that by perforce. I mean, your voice is your voice, but who you are. We right. have to capture that in 60 to 90 seconds. And so now we've gotten yeah. really good at that. So that's why that's Bookable great. is now Bookable, uh, bookable voiceover uh, training and demos. Oh, I love it. And, and I know that name, Greg. I believe I met Greg, I believe I met Greg through Don. You absolutely did. Don yeah. had the poker game and Greg was part of that poker game. Yes, and, yes. And, That's right. Uh, yeah. That's so and great that you're still working together all these we years. We still work together. And he's a massive voice talent in his own right now. Huge. Absolutely. Yeah. So talented. I mean, it's so cool to hear that journey. But at some point with the travel that you're doing, you're doing, uh, what is it called residencies or when you go do theater in different cities and yeah if you're lucky places. enough to have residencies and i had opportunities to do like whole summers at places but yeah. once you start doing promos the way i was doing them you're sort of like a doctor you're sort of on call you can't you're, just you're kinda, take off right the golden handcuffs yeah. right you want that problem on the other hand now you don't go anywhere so um you know we 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 did well enough that we could move uh, to a really beautiful area in California called Calabasas near Malibu. Mm -hmm. And you made my studio there and it's this beautiful place. And we had this mm -hmm. incredible looking studio, but I, I mean, I didn't even go to the beach. I, I mean, yeah. I was in Malibu in and around those parts, but I didn't get to enjoy any of it because I was always inside in my booth. So the question became, how can I travel and still keep my job? Because there's a long line of people behind you that are younger, they'll do it cheaper, and are just as or even way more talented than you. So if you step away from your job, you, you, know, you can't get a month off at AMC. You just have to be available. So you were my engineer at the time, and we kind of put our heads together like, if you need for your own mental you know, wellness to go do a show somewhere, be on stage, get out of this booth, um, we need to cobble together some sort of booth, travel like kit, travel kit, which we found online. I think someone on eBay was making component parts of things. And yeah, we found all kinds of, you know, random resources and tried them out. Things worked in various ways, but every time you would use them in a, and you know what you, you would try to use them for what you wanted them to for, which is to be travelable, to, right. to literally break the handcuffs. Hey of having your home studio. Nice. And these things would work to a degree, but they'd be too heavy, too bulky, you know, not made well, flimsy, et cetera, et cetera, right? So That's then right. you said, I need to make a better one of these. What can we do, right? I thought, well, for sure. I mean, I'm no inventor, but for sure, I knew what would make this easier, lighter, faster to assemble. Um, with more pieces in it that I need. Like there was like a music stand and there was a spotlight in it. And there, you know, I had to keep adding stuff and it got tighter and tighter. It was hot in there. You couldn't breathe in there. So every time, yeah, I would come back from a play, I'd say, you know, we, we kind of 
sit down and kind of go over the experience. What was it like? It was fine, but it could be better. What if, and could we, and how if, and we ultimately created the tri booth. Uh, and but the you fact, came up with the triangle floor plan. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that can was I, Can you, I just say how you, I did it? It was sort of my, yes. um, my uh, what was that movie? Um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know, the mashed potato scene. So I had, I had my mashed potato scene with straws. I had made a rectangle, like a rectangular box out of drinking straws. And I thought, how can I make this thing lighter? I can make it shorter. Wait a minute. What if I get rid of one of the legs and instead of squares on top, they were uh, equilateral triangles? Why not that? I lose multiple pieces of pipe and it would naturally be lighter. And then I thought yeah. that might be difficult to remember what part goes where and we could label all of them, which we tried labeling them. That was complicated. <laughs> yeah. So how then, are we going to do this? Colors, letters? Yeah, yeah exactly. We did. We had a whole alphabet. Uh, I remember seeing a tent that I had, had shock cord running through the whole thing inside, internally. And I thought, well, there it is. So I internally shock corded the entire thing and it broke down into these like two foot long sections I could put in any piece of luggage I already had. And it worked. I mean, like a charm. That super, was the big super deal. well. It was a. It, it was, was a, one thing to come up with the shape and the design that worked. It was another thing to create something that an actor traveling... And sometimes under duress, <laughs> are is able to assemble. Yeah, and, and that was one of the innovations of many. For yeah, sure. Yeah, and and then a lot of things kind of fell into line. Since you and I are not some giant corporation, we couldn't have pieces made in America or China or India or anywhere. Everything that this thing had to be built of had to be available. Uh, and so we made one. And by the way, I'd like to say that we made it for the good of the industry, but I made it for me. <laughs> you know, I, this was like you my did. thing. I needed it to work. And you, then the one version time, one or one point or whatever you want to call it was for you. It was that's right. spoke for you. That's right. And I took it to New York once and I had it set up at my agent's office because I needed to record something. And while I was there, he, here's my next moment where somebody walks by uh, and notices uh, Bray Poor who is a voiceover actor, who is a stage and film actor, uh, and he's a sound engineer for shows on Broadway. He was at uh, he was at that same building at the same time and saw this thing, and he looked at it, and he said, I'm sorry, what is that? And I went, oh, it's my travel booth. And he went, I'll buy it. I went, oh, no, 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 it's, it's not for sale. And he said, listen to me, make it so I can buy it. And I went, okay. So... I made another one. And I mean, if, if if he if he had not walked by and seen this, yeah, this would not exist as a product. That's right. Probably. I That's mean, right. who knows? Maybe later you decide. Well, maybe more people like. But just that was the moment, right? That was the turning point where it went from a one of one bespoke, yeah. to transitioning into a product. And so we immediately started refining it making it prettier. The pipes were not like irrigation PVC, which are heavy. These are thin-walled, UV-rated, uh, furniture-grade PVC. We found custom fittings that are very hard to find anywhere else, that we have uh, wholesale deals with companies. I mean, it just got better and better and better. We found like the perfect LED light to go in it with the perfect color, and we found the perfect uh, copy stand and beverage holder, and everything was gonna come with it. Like the only thing that wouldn't come with it is the computer, the mic, the interface, and talent. Like that's all up to yeah. you, but yeah. everything else was gonna come in that package. And we started selling them to like Joe Cipriano, and like some names came out and wanted this. And and then we needed a website. And then you, you and I decided that we would try to get this thing uh, patented. And so we started that process with lawyers and it was patent I think that pending. was you. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? We're going to get this patented. But hey. But we're patented you did now. It. You yeah. did it. Five, five, Almost five years from beginning to the document being yeah. handed to you. And that was about a year ago, right? It was October last That's year. That's right. You and got so that my document. whole life, I've always been performing. Um, and... Suddenly, I was building with my hands, and it's a great thing. I sort of would like disassociate, and my mind could go other places and think about bigger thoughts and just let my hands take over and just build things. I think it's a really important thing. I didn't have any hobby like that, like 
woodcraft. That was or, not you growing up, right? It wasn't me you growing always, up, right? I've always heard the story of your dad who would fix the printer with a butter knife, right? <laughs> right. Or try. <laughs> That's right. You know, it was not, you were not growing up. I mean, I grew up tinkering. Yes, I, we you grew did. up making things. We were really into RC cars and hobbies and gas. That wasn't you, but it wasn't now me. you have now fully embraced this, yeah, right? this whole thing. And it's, it's true. It's amazing like, to see it. Necessity is the mother of invention. Like the fact is, I'm very proud that I'm also an inventor now. You know, I, I mean, it's a, it was it's a, it was really touching when I got all the paperwork back from the patent office, and there's a book and s- schematics. I'm like, wow, we we really did this. This thing really exists. And a and, magician. And yeah, and over <laughs> 300 booths later, um, it's time for an upgrade. Yeah, and yeah. So we Something's know that in the works. that. There's some magical things happening. All the things that that were not part of the first one that I I just never thought would be necessary. Yeah, I've come to think that they are, and they are possible, and they are happening. That's brilliant. I, it's just so exciting, and I love watching your enthusiasm, especially right now as this product, this next version of a product comes online. And you're every every couple of weeks, you're like, okay, George, here's the <laughs> here's the test, and you send me these clips, and yeah. you know, it's like it's bittersweet because when you for the longest time we were just a short ride away, and you're not anymore, and yeah. that's bittersweet. But it's also amazing that you have a space and a home, and, and just this whole thing that's conducive to doing this work and creativity and stuff. So. You know, we we're doing it all virtually, and uh, occasionally we get to see each other in person. That's right. Um, you know, I think that's one reason why it took so long to get to this interview. Is first of all, we have this; we really do communicate on a regular basis, and um, you know, we've known each other so long, and have interviewed have interviewed you on VOBS, and <laughs> it was right. just like, what the heck? I was looking through, and I was like, where's Rick? Yeah. On my trusted partner's page, <laughs> like, where is he? Yeah. So, oh my gosh. Well. Tell us how uh, our clients can become your client. Tell tell us where they can find services through your bookable service, and then sure. of course how they would get a tri booth. Sure. Well, if you're interested in voiceover training, no matter where you are, sort of in your voiceover journey, just starting or you're a pro, maybe looking to up your booking rates, or maybe try a different area of voiceover, or you're looking for a new demo. Um, the best thing to do to find me is I'm on uh, online at bookablevo.com, bookablevo.com. Um, if you're interested in just learning more about me, trolling or whatever, uh, rickwasserman.com <laughs> is still active. All my demos and TV and my Zest Soap days are on there too. Uh, <laughs> and of course, if you're interested in the Tri Booth, you just go to tribooth.com and you will see pictures of George and me and the Tri Booth and, and, um, on social media, we're all over social media on on um, every platform with information about the booth. There are regular sales. We have tips and tricks. We have mm-hmm. testimonials and all kinds of fun stuff. Lots of content. T- tell me real quick again, and, and then for your for your coaching, which are your primary genres that you are coaching and doing demos in? Well, we make demos and we coach in all areas of the voiceover industry. If you're interested in what I know best. What I know best, obviously, is promo, just because I've done it so much. But again, I wouldn't teach you how to do promo like me. The idea is to make sure that you have a a process that works for you. Uh, But any area of storytelling, so we're talking about commercial, promo, trailer, animation, narration, video game, live announce. Um, Because you've worked in pretty much all these genres. Yeah, I do do all of them. The only area in voiceover that I don't do while I teach, I don't do personally is audiobooks. It's only because I don't have the focus to sit still and read professionally. I can only seem to manage to be able to do it for my own leisure. But professionally Yeah, the idea of sitting in the booth or or as as I've heard some say, take a book and sit in a closet and read a chapter. (laughs) Yeah. If that appeals to you, you may have a career in in audio narrating. It's just not not for everybody. That is, by the way, the real blessing of promo for a guy like me is that I'm in and out of the booth in sometimes five minutes. I do the promos for Meet the Press now. So it's, uh, you know, like Sunday on Meet the Press, da, 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 only on NBC. I don't know. I heard you. I heard you the other day. I was like, hey, yeah, that's Rick. Yeah. (laughs) So I like that. That's my favorite. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Man, we could talk so much longer, but you know, 
how long do people want to watch you blather and me blather probably, on anyway? Probably but not. it's so lovely to chat with you again. Um, I'm going to be seeing you soon. Hopefully, we've got so much more to do together. For sure. And uh, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you for your time today, Rick. Thank you, George. Cheers, man. I appreciate everything you do. And say hi to your family, Tamara and the kids. Thank you. And I hope everybody's doing well. Thank Take you. Take care.